Okay, it's 5.30 somewhere, and that place is here. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Advanced Programming with Java here at PSU. Uh, I'm David Whitlock. I, I teach this course. Um, I've never taught it in Lincoln Hall before, uh, and this is exciting. This is the Fine Arts Building. We've got people like practicing the bassoon in the other room or whatever. Uh, we have operable windows because uh, this building is like 400 years old or something, and so we can get nice fresh air and noise from the streetcar and the and everything else. Um, the desks, on the other hand, that, that kind of sucks. Um, uh, so I don't know if we're going to be able to do much pair programming comfortably, but uh, we'll give it a try later on. Um, let's see here. We have got a lot of stuff to cover tonight. Um, so tonight we're probably going to be here until almost the regular starting time. Uh, four hours is a long time uh, for you and for me. Uh, so normally we won't go that late, but tonight might be kind of like we've got a lot of stuff to, uh, to cover um, and a lot of stuff to learn about and talk about. Um, so um, I'll dive right in. Okay, so I've got a couple of introductory slides to sort of get us started and then we'll dive into the, the real uh, content. So uh, in case you're here for like French 103, this is the wrong room, this is Java. Hi everyone. Okay. So, what's on the agenda tonight? Um, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm going to introduce the graders. Uh, will be the team that is supporting you as you learn Java this uh, this term. We'll talk about the enrollment situation. Uh, the class uh, is enrolled full. There is a long wait list for the undergrads. Uh, there are a couple of graduate students that want to get in also, and so we'll talk about how we're going to do all of that. Then we'll talk about this course, what you can expect over the next week, uh, eight weeks. We'll talk about the syllabus. We'll talk about how we approach the work, the kinds of things that you'll learn. Then we'll start looking at some code. So we're going to start diving into our first uh, Java project. And uh, I'll walk you guys through uh, an example Java project that is close enough to the projects that you'll be working on that I hope it'll be instructive to help you figure out how to get started with Java, the programming language, and all the tools that come along with it. Um, we'll also learn about uh, <coughs> one of your first assignments, which is a, a series of what are called cones. Um, that are a bunch of little learning exercises that will teach you about the, the language. We'll also learn about test-driven development. Uh, so we'll learn about this technique for approaching your code that helps you build in quality from the, uh, from the beginning. And we'll see how to apply that in a Java project. So we got a lot of stuff to do tonight. Um, that being said, I want to take uh, a couple of breaks. I'm an old man. I can't be up here for very long. I... Uh, Need to rest my feet, um, and uh, and you guys will probably need a, a break too. Um, so, without further ado, let's uh, move on to who we are. So, uh, there are three of us that will be uh, working with you this term. Uh, there's myself, uh, and so I'm the instructor for the course. Uh, I'll be here every Wednesday night uh, talking to you. I also have office hours an hour before class, so from 4:30 to 5:30, or actually since probably 4:30 to. Uh, uh, 515 uh, over at Hot Lips Pizza. So come uh, grab a slice with me and we can talk about your projects or whatever. Um, I probably have some room in the computer science department also. It's probably really small with like no natural light and probably smells funny or something. So I, I, I'll just, you know, join me for dinner. We also have two graders. Thank you so much um, uh, for this course. Um, uh, there's Nirdeshki, Nirdeshika uh, and Rashab. I'm really looking forward to working with them. Uh, Nirdashika took the course uh, last term. Uh, Rashab comes highly recommended from the grader uh, from last term. So uh, these people know their stuff. And they'll be handling most of the grading. Um, so when it comes to assigning, uh, grading your quizzes and grading your uh, projects, um, they'll be the ones that are determining that. Um, and, uh, but I've asked them to be uh, participants in the class discussion forums uh, and stuff like that to make sure that you guys get the feedback that you need to uh, be able to do well in the course. See, and neither of them is here tonight, right? Oh yeah, you, got, you guys are here. I'm sorry, I didn't even see you. Come in, uh, Rashab. How you? How about you introduce yourself first? Uh, stand up, everybody's Rashab. Awesome. <laughs> and Nagashika.
Awesome. Good deal. Thanks for showing up. Uh, they haven't officially been hired yet. The department's a little bit behind. I don't want to get in trouble with the union or anything. Uh, but I think it's okay because I think they're off protesting someplace. So, so we're good tonight. Um, okay, let's move on. So, enrollment. Uh, I've been teaching this course since the year 2000, and it occurred to me that someone who was born in the year that I started taking the class is now old enough to be enrolled at PSU to take the class, um, which, uh, first of all, makes me feel kind of old. And uh, also, and, and well, but I guess it really shouldn't. I mean, I started teaching it when I was 15. Um, but, but, but what it really, really tells me is that uh, there, there's something uh, important about what we're doing here. Um, you know, it, obviously this has a staying power, uh, you know, what, what it is that we're learning about, what uh, I'm looking to teach you, and certainly what uh, I hope you're looking to learn. Um, and so it's great that they keep inviting me back year after year. Um, and the course has gotten really popular. A couple years ago they added a graduate section uh, to the course. And um, now, uh, well, basically they've made it as big as they can make it. So there's a total enrollment of 60 students, um, divided 30 undergraduate, 30 graduate. Um, and uh, if they made it any bigger, I think they have to move into like a lecture hall or like the ice hockey rink or something like that. I don't know what they can do. So um, 60 is big as I can make it. Um, unfortunately, it's registered full right now, uh, which is a bummer. So uh, as I communicated to you, though, I, I want to teach the people who are interested in the people that want to be here. So um, uh, the, the, the rule that I've applied over the last couple of years is that uh, I, I, you know, you're gonna, I want the people that are uh, interested in the course and willing to show up to uh, attend. So uh, if, uh, if, if you're someone who's registered for the course who is not here tonight, and obviously I'm not talking to you, but those people, uh, if, unless they've made some prior arrangement, a couple of people will have, um, I'm going to drop them from the course. So it's like be here or forget it because I want it so I can let someone else in. Um, and so what we'll do uh, at the first break is I've got these little cards here for everybody to fill out where you put in your, uh, let's see here, wait a second, uh, where you can, you know, where you write your name and then the last four digits of your student ID so I know exactly who you are in case there's any question, in case I can't read your name or in case uh, uh, there's people with the same, uh, with the same name. Uh, and then tell me if you're already registered or if you'd like to register and then if you're looking for the undergraduate or graduate section. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll take all those back and uh, I'll figure out if there's anybody who was registered who didn't show up and I'll uh, ask the department to uh, remove those people from the, uh, unregister those people from the course and instead uh, I'll then add people from the, from the wait list. Um, there's always a couple of people that get let in. Um, for me, uh, I want, I'm gonna keep the total enrollment um, to, uh, to 60. So I think I noticed at least over the weekend there were only 26 graduate students registered. So it might be that I can get more than 30 undergraduates, uh, which is good because uh, quite frankly, this is an undergraduate course. I'm happy to have the graduate students. They're awesome people. They make great graders. Um, but this is, you know, uh, this is a, uh, a, an advanced Java programming course, which is really targeted to, to undergraduates. Um, any questions about that? Nope. Okay, cool. So we'll we'll come back to that at the first break. Oh, no. Okay, good. Okay. This is the uh, the course homepage. Is my homepage here at uh, PSU. Um, it's got all sorts of hopefully helpful links. Uh, but most importantly, it has the course schedule. <coughs> There's gonna be a lot of background noise in the recording, but that's the way it goes. Uh, so uh, let's see here. We'll start with uh, well. We'll start with, with talking about uh, how the, the, the class is organized uh, generally. So as I said, I've taught this course for a long time, and for the first I don't know 10, 12 years of it, um, I taught it like a traditional course. Uh, I was up here, sage on the stage, imparting my wisdom about uh, Java language syntax and object oriented programming and XML parsing. And weren't we having a great time, right? Why are so many people asleep? Uh, I don't understand. Um, after, uh, after a while, it got kind of boring for me. And I thought, wow, if I'm kind of getting bored up here. It must be terrifying for you guys. Like, ah, you know. So um, I decided to flip the class. So the lectures I recorded, and they're up on YouTube. YouTube. Um, there are links to them here. I've also got links to the slides. Uh, so I have, oh, that's probably a bad example. Um, I have links to the slides, like here's the, uh, here's the J unit slides. That would be... Welcome to Advanced uh, Java Programming at Portland State that. Universe. 
And then the slides, there you go, are right here. Um, so depending on how you learn best, if you're someone who just wants to read over the slides and, and you'll get it, great, you've got that option. Uh, if you'd rather uh, see the slides and have a talk track uh, in the background, the screencasts are, uh, are, are meant for that. So hopefully these uh, learning uh, tools work well for you. Um, I expect that you review the slides before coming to class. Oftentimes the stuff we cover in class will be related to the slides, related to the content. Um, and it's also uh, here is an opportunity for us to have a conversation about what you see in the, see in the slides uh, and what you've learned from that. So uh, that's how you can best prepare for class. There is a textbook. It's mainly a reference book, um, and it's old uh, at this point. Um, textbooks, uh, do people even have textbooks anymore? They, okay, that's something, yeah, because someone's making money. They still cost like 80 or $100. So, really? Probably, probably even more now, right? It's, yeah, this one's, yeah, I mean, if you get the print copy. Yeah, it's also available for PDF for free because um, that seemed like a good price to me. Um, but seriously, it's like the 21st century. It's like you learn from Stack Overflow. I mean, textbooks are good for people that learn that way, but there are lots of options for, uh, for learning. Um, so that's what you need to do to get ready for class. Let's talk about the syllabus and uh, more information about how the course is organized. So, so for me, this course is, uh, the title of the course is Advanced Programming with, with Java. It grew, it was an evolution of the advanced Java programming course that, uh, that I sort of started out teaching. We've evolved it in, in some interesting ways. Um, the, 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 the language syntax, object-oriented programming, you guys have seen that before, right? You've gotten it in your, under, under, uh, in your lower division courses. Um, and so there, that's not the primary focus of the course. Really, the, co focus of the, uh, the primary focus of the course is uh, to learn how to program by doing it yourself and by watching me do it. Um, uh, and, and I hope that it's fun along the way. I, I intend this course to have maybe some topics that you haven't seen before, like writing REST APIs, working with web applications, um, uh, doing uh, you know, user interface programming. Um, and, and I hope that gives you a, a diversity of subjects that maybe you haven't seen in other courses. The way we do this is the lectures are online, like I said. We'll also have in-class discussions, and I do want this to be a discussion, which I realize sort of in this format is difficult because there's like 60 people looking at me and I'm up here doing all the talking. Um, so we'll, we'll try our best. Um, and the way uh, I usually structure the course is I have people pair off and do some pair programming. Physically, that might be difficult in this room, so I'm not sure how it's going to work. I have to think about it. Um, along the way, uh, I want you to see a lot of code in this course. So you'll see me writing code, but there's lots of codes I have up on my GitHub site and that you can see in other forms um, for seeing not only the Java syntax, but also understanding how you structure a program, how you implement your algorithms in, in Java. Your work, your contribution in this course, beyond sort of the reading and the learning, the way that you demonstrate uh, your knowledge uh, is in a couple of forms. Um, the primary one is a multi-phase project. So there will be uh, several projects throughout the term, uh, roughly one due every week. There are a couple where there's, uh, there's the five-phase project, which is sort of built up every week. And then there's also that Cohen's that uh, I'll, I'll get back to later, which is due in four weeks or something like that. Um, and as we'll see, that constitutes the vast majority of your grade. And then um, also there's, uh, I want you to be able to explain what you've learned in writing. And so we do that through the quizzes and the, the final exam. So I hope that's pretty standard stuff. What are we going to cover? Uh, well, this is mostly, again, in the, in the lectures that are online. We'll talk about the Java language syntax. You'll see me use it a lot. There's also some, uh, some lecture content on about it. Object-oriented design and programming. Java is an object-oriented language. Classes and fields and methods are all first-class citizens in the language. Um, and we'll be learning about how to use those. We'll also uh, be leveraging the standard Java class libraries. And so these are things that, you know, you don't need to write your own linked list in Java. Yay. Um, uh, learning how to do I.O., learning how to do uh, networking, all that good stuff, using a standard set of libraries that, you know, any Java programmer um, and any uh, Java application can, can leverage. We'll also be looking at what I think of as the software engineering side of, uh, of Java development. So we'll be focusing a lot on testing, in particular unit testing and doing test-driven development. And we'll also look at using Apache, Apache Maven to build your Java projects. Uh, these projects, uh, it's advanced 
programming. So it's not simple stuff. It's not just command line arguments, although we'll start there. Um, we'll uh, see over time uh, that our projects and the stuff that we talk about in class gets more and more complex. And so you need the help of a build system to keep everything straight to uh, make sure that you have all the dependencies that you need in order to you know, really do um, you know, powerful uh, application development. Later on in the term, sort of in the second half of the course, also known as next month, I guess, um, we'll be looking at uh, developing web applications. So we'll be looking at um, writing uh, a REST API using Java servlets. We'll also be looking uh, a little bit at the dependency injection uh, design pattern and how it helps <laughs> you test uh, your uh, objects in isolation from each other. And then finally, we'll conclude with uh, developing a rich internet application, a rich user interface, using a framework called Google Web Toolkit, which allows you to write a web application almost exclusively in, in Java. Uh, and we'll see how we can apply a lot of the uh, design patterns and uh, good software development uh, techniques that we learned earlier in the course to uh, writing web applications. So. That's what we're going to cover uh, in in the course. There's some things that we don't cover. We don't cover database programming. We don't co discover. We don't. We do a little bit of distributed computing, I suppose, with the client uh, with, with the with the REST stuff and the client server. Um, but we don't do anything in the cloud. Uh, there's also some other things you can explore in Java. Um, but uh, we've only got eight weeks, and so this is what we cover in the eight weeks here. Any questions about the content before we move on to the grading policies? Okay. Great. Okay. 60% of your grade is a code that you write. So that's the multi-phase project. There are five phases to the project. There's also the Java cones. Um, and that's built up over the entire term. And these projects build on one another. Um, so it's really important that uh, you, uh, you know, have a solid projects one and two, because otherwise by the time you get to project four, if you're still struggling with parsing the command line or figuring out how to uh, organize your objects, it's, it's gonna hurt. Um, and so it's important to me that the graders give you timely feedback on that, and we'll talk more probably next time about um, uh, the, you know, the time frame for that kind of stuff. So that's 60% of your grade right there. Um, there are also eight quizzes. Uh, each is worth 4%, and I dropped the lowest grade to give you another 28%. Um, all of the quizzes are online using D2L. Um, this saves us time in class, uh, and it also uh, makes it easier to grade. Um, Let's see here. Uh, oh, yeah, and there are different sections. Oh, okay, right, sorry. Two of the quizzes are surveys, too. So I also issue uh, two surveys through the term. There's one at midterm to sort of do a check-in uh, so you can let me know how I'm doing. Um, and then there's also uh, a survey at the end to say, hey, okay, now we are at the end. Uh, you know, tell me what you thought about the course holistically. And then there is a final exam, which is worth the remaining 12% of your grade. Um, so, you know, I, I hope it's clear that uh, the most important thing in this class is writing code. Um, it's good to know the theory. I want you to be able to explain it. I'm going to assess you on that, but that's a smaller part of your grade than, uh, than, it, is with the, than it is for your programming. I, I guess one other note, it's not on here explicitly. Um, you know, the, the reason that I record uh, the, the lectures like what we're doing here um, is to accommodate people that can't make class. You know, we all have lives. There's also summer and stuff. You might have vacations planned. Um, uh, or, you know, or if, you know, if you're sick, sick one day, we only meet once a week. And so there's not a lot of time for us to, uh, to interact. And plus, um, I, I think there's a lot that I want to teach you here, but I'm going to do it by demonstrating, uh, you know, how to... How to structure your code, how to write unit tests, how to do test driven development, things like that. Um, and so I want you to be able to experience that best you can, even if you're not physically here. So I ask that you do come to class, um, but I also understand that uh, you know, not everybody can make it. And so I want to be able to accommodate that uh, to give you the best experience that I can. Back on the grading policies. So um, all of the, let's see here, all of the work is due. Uh, right before class. So again, to encourage you to come to class, all of the work is due at the beginning of class. Actually, I think in the assignments I say 6, 6 p.m. This course has always started at 5 on the first day and then I move it to 6. So 5.30 start time has gotten me a little thrown off. Um, but I'll figure it out. But anyway, they're due before class. Um, I, I do have the following late policy, though. So you have two late days to use during the, uh, the term. You can use it on any assignment. Um, and you know, let's say the assignment is due at 6 o'clock. If you turn it in at 6.05, poof, that's your first late day. Um, uh, 
Uh, and, and so anyway, so you get two of those during the term. I'm really more flexible than that. Um, but I need a policy just in case someone like lawyers up or whatever and says, well, you didn't say it couldn't turn on project one the last day, you know, stuff like that. Um, nothing against lawyers, by the way, especially if any of you are lawyers. Um, you may also uh, resubmit one project for regrading. Um, this happens to a number of people. They misunderstand something about the assignment or maybe their command line parsing uh, is, is wrong. Like every test case fails. I'm not going to give you a zero because of that. I, I want you to... <coughs> Uh, I want you to be successful in the class, and I want you to um, to, to, to learn. And uh, even if you know, so that means that okay, yep, uh, you can you know resubmit uh, something for regrading. Um, I ask that you do it within uh, one week of the original grading. So let's say that you get you know your projects back on like you know Sunday evening or something. You've got another week from that to uh, to regrade. Again, I, I don't want to see project one coming in uh, on the last day of class. Um, that's not cool. Uh, my policy is to grade on a curve. Um, you know, again, I expect there to be some diversity in grades, um, but there's usually not much of a curve. Um, I've designed the course so that, yep, you know, most people will get an A or a B, um, and uh, history shows that that's uh, the case. Um, so uh, if you know, if you maybe you've missed a couple quizzes or you know your uh, projects, you know, you're, you're losing some points there. You're like, oh, but the curve will save me. The curve's not going to save you. So, um, you know, it's not a problem. It, you know, most, most everybody does very well, um, but don't rely on, the, uh, on a curve, unlike some courses, apparently. Um, let's see here. Oh, regarding the two sections of the course. Um, I don't know if this makes me a, a bad professor or something, but they're essentially the same. The policies are the same. The, uh, um, you know, I've, I've instructed the graders to, uh, you know, apply the same... Uh, the, the same expectations to both the undergraduate and the graduate works. Um, however, each section is graded on its own curve. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, there's not, usually not much of a curve. Um, but uh, because they are separate sections, uh, I will assign final letter grades, or rather I reserve the right to assign final letter grades um, independently of each other, even though everybody's going to be evaluated the same way. But, like, you know, a 90 might be, uh, you know, an A- minus in the undergraduate, but it might be a B- plus in the graduate or something like that, for instance. We'll have to see. Any questions on the grading policies? Hopefully it seems pretty straightforward. Okay. Okay. Um, don't cheat. No one ever cheats. It's okay. You guys are, you know, you guys know what, uh, you know, not, not, not to cheat, but I just got to feel I have to tell you here on the first day. Um, uh, we'll catch you. Um, and, you know, I haven't had a cheating incident in a number of years, and I'm sure I won't have one. Uh, this time, but if you do, uh, I'll go call your mom and tell them that you cheated or something. I don't know. I'll refer you to the department, um, and uh, they can take care of it, but no, it's not a big deal. Um, I use this tool called Moss, which has been around for a while, but it's actually really effective to detect plagiarism. Um, uh, it's more beyond just copying code. If, you, you know, if you're smart and you like remove some comments or change some variable names, it'll find you, especially on the more, uh, uh, on the more complex code. Um, so uh, don't, you know, don't be tempted because we'll find you. Um, the department policy is sort of like a shooting to submit for credit work that you do not create or allow your work to be submitted for the work of another student. Um, that is true. Uh, but I also want to encourage you to work together. We'll be doing pair programming in this class. Software development is not an individual sport. It's a team sport. Um, and so I don't want to discourage you from talking. I don't want to discourage you from sketching stuff out on the whiteboard. Do all of that, um, but don't look at other people's code. So like, don't copy other people's code. And if you have you know, a question about syntax or you're seeing some you know, funny error or whatever for the compiler, yeah, you know, th there, there are gray lines there. And I trust you. You're adults, and you've been doing this for a while in computer science. So I think you know what's appropriate and not appropriate. And I've already spent like five minutes of your life telling you about cheating, so don't cheat. Okay? Got it? Yay, we're all good. Okay. More fun stuff? Um, lecture notes are available. Again, they're associated with the, uh, with, with the, uh, the YouTube videos. Um, if you want to have them in class, that's great. Print them out. Um, but, uh, or just have a you know, copy there on your computer. Uh, please don't wait until the last minute to start the projects. They might seem simple, especially the first couple of ones, but history has shown that there's some complexity there and that uh, maybe, you know, 
you can read the assignment and it seems straightforward in your head, but there's a tool set to work with. There's a new language, so please you know, start them uh, as soon as possible. Uh, documentation is part of the course, and we'll talk more about it next week. Um, I advise you to document your code as you write it. You know, you're write, about to write a little bit of code, yeah, you know, put a little document, uh, a little comment explaining uh, what it is. Um, if you can say it in English, I found that's a good way to say it in Java, right? So if you can express what your the intent of your method or the intent of your class in words, it helps you uh, implement it. Um, while I love hearing the sound of my own voice, especially when it bounces off the wall back at me and stuff, I'm not here. I mean, I could do this in an empty room, and maybe I do at times. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm here for you. So while I have a lot of knowledge I want to impart on you, really what I'm here to do is to help you in your learning um, as you learn about Java, as you learn about uh, software engineering in the year 2018. So please ask questions when you have them. Um, you might need to get my attention. I talk really fast and I sort of get into what I'm saying. Um, but really, you know, I'm not here for me. I'm, I'm here for you. Um, and, you know, I, I know in a big class and, you know, with your peers, some of you who you might know from different classes, something sometimes be difficult to, uh, to ask those questions. Um, I encourage you to please, you know, overcome that, that, that concern. Um, there's really no shame in asking questions. And uh, in my experience, uh, you know, if, if you've got a question, you're probably not the only one. So, you know, please be brave enough to, to ask it, uh, you know, in front of everybody else. Um, this course has been fine-tuned over the years, but it is a senior level course. There is a lot of work here. And uh, <laughs> something that I've heard from my students in the past is that, wow, if we're taking a lot of other programming intensive courses, you know, your operating systems, your compilers or whatever, um, you might want to reevaluate your schedule. Uh, you know, summer, the weather is nice. Yeah, do you want to spend, like, your entire, you know, life there in front of your screen uh, doing this course. If you've got other stuff, you know, re re rethink about it. But you've probably already made your decision because you're here and you signed up. Um, the code examples are for you. Um, you know, go home and play with them. Uh, we'll, we'll be doing some uh, coding here in class. We won't necessarily finish all of it. I encourage you to uh, go home and experiment with it some more. Um, that's what they're there for. Again, uh, my office hours are the hour before class at Hot Lips Pizza. Uh, come join me for uh, some sli a slice and some talk about your projects and stuff. Uh, I think I'm the last remaining user of Google+. Plus. Um, you all have Google accounts, so you all have this. Um, and personally, what I like about this is that every time I go to search something on Google, if there's like a notification, it shows up there. So it helps me be more responsive. Um, I also leverage... Um, Google Hangouts a lot for video chats. Um, so uh, please um, join the, uh, the community. Uh, this is uh, a number of you already have. Um, this, is, this is my primary means of communicating with all of you. So when I've got something like, okay, hey, your projects have been graded, or oh, hey, uh, I've been getting a lot of you know, questions and emails about this thing, or I just discovered a big bug in my code, huh? Sorry, this is what you need to do to fix it. Not that that's ever happened before. Um, but uh, I'll communicate it uh, with you here. And it sends you emails and, uh, and, and stuff like that. So it might not be everybody's cup of tea, but um, it's worked well for me over the years. Uh, I'm also uh, you know, available via email. Um, during the day, you know, I have a day job. I work for a company called Tripwire. Um, it's, uh, I don't, but my response time isn't always, uh, isn't always that great during the day. Um, I'll try to get back to you, though, as, uh, as, as soon as I can. Like I said, there's the, uh, the class webpage. That's where you can find all of the information uh, about the course. Um, and lastly, uh, is something that's actually very, very important. Um, the first Java program that I want you to run uh, is the following. You can do this on the CS department's uh, machines. I'm going to close this window a little bit. There we go. Um, this is a, a simple Java program that uh, asks you a couple survey questions. Uh, this is how we get information about all of you. Um, and what it does is it asks you a couple questions like, hey, your name, and uh, like, you know, are you a graduate or undergraduate student, all that good stuff. And it emails uh, the graders account. There's a CS Department grader account. Um, uh, a, a little XML file that I then import into my grade book so I can keep track of all of your grades. Um, it's also a good first test to make sure that your environment is configured correctly to run a Java program. 
So please do this as soon as possible. I can't record any of your grades until you do, and I will nag you incessantly um, uh, if you submit work to be graded, and I don't have this because I won't know who you are. Um, and that's, uh, that's not good for anybody. So anyway. Um, uh, and actually, so it's very important then that you have an account on the CS department's uh, Linux machines. Does everybody have like a cat account and everything? Okay. If you do not, uh, please get one as soon as possible. So that is a rough overview of the course. Questions? Really? I'm not that clear. No? No, yeah, we'll figure it out. Okay. Good deal. Okay, where to next? Okay, on to Java. Um, in this course, your projects, and we'll get to the projects in a little while, probably after a break. Um, I uh, I have a way of sort of creating the project files for you, uh, and then you'll uh, work with those and eventually submit them. We'll talk about submitting projects next week. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to introduce you to some of the tools that you'll be using uh, to, uh, to build your projects um, by walking through this uh, simple Project Zero uh, with you guys. This is not something that uh, we, uh, that is submitted. Um, but it looks a lot like uh, your first couple of projects. So what I'm going to do, uh, well, okay, so, so this, uh, in, in, in this uh, Project Zero, uh, and actually this used to be the project way back in the very beginning of the class, um, back when it was 10 weeks. I, I originally taught like in the fall, in the spring, like a sane person where there was enough time to cover all this stuff and it's a little rushed in the summer, um, but people have gotten through it, mostly. Um, what, you're, what you're going to do is create a simple student class. Um, that uh, is a subclass of a human, which is actually a class that I wrote. Um, and uh, the whole idea is that this sort of gets you started with Java. You'll see what a class is. You'll write some methods. Um, and, uh, and tonight we'll do some test-driven development uh, in this class, using uh, you know, the, the classes created here. Um, this is what your student class will look like. So the student has a constructor uh, that takes some arguments, like the name of the student, the classes that the uh, student is taking, uh, the student's GPA, and also the student's gender, which is male or female. Uh, I guess it's sort of showing the age of the course. We realize that we accept people of, uh, of other uh, alternate genders now, but for the, for the sake of this assignment, to keep things simple, we'll just have those. Uh, the class also has some methods, like uh, everybody says something, and actually all my students say this class is too much work. Uh, and then there's also a two-string method, which we'll talk about. It's a special method that's invoked in certain places that, de that describes the student. The student class is also a main program in Java, which means that it has a main method. It's public and static, returns void, and it takes the command line arguments that come in from the, man li the command line. And what this uh, program does is it'll parse the command line and create a student uh, object based on what's there. We'll print the description uh, by invoking, and print the description of it, invoking its two string. Um, and so then, let me go down to an example right here. So if we run uh, the Java virtual machine with uh, this jar file, and I'll talk a little bit about what that is, with these command line arguments, I expect it to, uh, the student program will output the following. It says Dave has a GPA of 3.64, because here was the name, here was the, uh, the uh, GPA, and uh, it's taking these three classes, and then he says this class is too much work. So that's what your program is going to do. To get you started, um, we're going to use something called uh, Maven to, uh, first of all, create a skeleton project, and then also um, build your project. And all that skeleton project and all that configuration is source code. And uh, source code should be under version control. And so something that I leverage extensively in the course, it's not required for you, but I highly recommend it, is to uh, put your code under uh, version control. Um, and I recommend Git, and I recommend using GitHub to, uh, to make it uh, publicly accessible so that you can easily share it in between machines. Um, how many of you have worked with GitHub before? 
Oh, good. Most of you. Um, okay, so at least you're familiar with it. Um, that That's good, so um, I won't go too slowly, but I realize there's some of you who haven't seen it before, so I'll try to explain my best. And uh, regardless of how familiar you are, familiar you are with it, um, if there's something that uh, I go through too fast or something you want me to elaborate on, please raise your hand and make me stop talking. Okay. So, um, so to begin with, um, Git is a... Uh, let me make sure I get the external one. Uh, Git is a tool for uh, basically doing version control of files. So, uh, you know, the whole idea is that, you know, hey, we write source code, actually we write all sorts of files, right? They can be, you know, Word documents, they can be uh, HTML files, but they can also be Java source code, they can be C or C++ source code. And uh, there's a couple of things that you want. You want to be able to evolve your code over time and uh, look at the history. Sometimes you want to go back in time, right? It's like, you know, I, I know I've done it. It's like, oh, I just wrote a bunch of code and everything's broken. And you know what? I just want to abandon ship and go all like, you know, Doc Brown and get in the DeLorean and go back to like three hours ago, back when everything worked and the world was full of sunshine and roses. Um, and Git is a tool that will allow you to do that. Um, you also want to be able to share your code with other people, right? If you collaborate on something, you want to be able to write some code and easily share that code with other people. And you want to be able to collaborate on the same files, right? So if you go back, you know, like, well, before uh, these tools were widely available, what did people do? <laughs> they like emailed or, 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 or copied files to various directories. And then if two people had, you know, changed the same file, you had to figure out how to take this person's changes and integrate them with this other person's changes. And it was incredibly error prone and, uh, and sucked. So uh, these, these uh, revision control systems um, uh, became really popular. The, the current evolution of these tools are tools like Git, Git that allow you to not only have revision control, but also allows you to have uh, globally distributed uh, source code repositories so that you can enable workflows like, okay, hey, I'm, you know, on the train in a tunnel or in a submarine or whatever, and I can write my code and I can commit my changes, but then when I come up for air, I can share my code with everybody else and things are merged nicely. There's good uh, tracking of the changes so that um, I, can, I can participate fully. And the experience is pretty much the same no matter whether I'm here again, underground in a cave or I'm, uh, you know, or I'm fully connected to the, to the internet. GitHub, is a website and an online service that allows you to uh, store your Git repositories. Um, and I'm going to use, uh, actually I have well, several repositories here on, uh, on GitHub. I guess I'll walk through, well, I guess one of them is most relevant to you right now. So um, I have one called Portland State Java, and this contains all of the source code that I've written for the, uh, for the class. And this is linked to... Well, let's see here. I guess you can get it here on this badge right here on my page, and then also uh, under source code right here. That points to, uh, to GitHub. Um, this is uh, code. That, there's lots of code up here. Um, I think for you guys, the examples are probably the most interesting, although you'll look at some of the family tree stuff later on in the course to see how you can do things like write REST APIs and... Uh, do the pretty printing and stuff like that. So um, I like this because you know I can work and share it with everybody on GitHub. It's a it's a it's a nice service. You can get uh, you can get uh, academic accounts for for free. There are two kind of repositories. There's public ones uh, like the ones that I'll be sharing with you that uh, that anybody can see and anybody can. Uh, uh, well, I won't talk about forking yet and stuff. Um, you, and I think the academic uh, account, academic license, also gets you a certain number of private repositories. So I encourage you guys to use a private repository for your code. Um, that way you can still check it in, and maybe if you want to collaborate with somebody on something, you can, um, but not the entire world doesn't see it. So again, it's your work, it's your code. Try to protect it so people don't cheat off of you. Um, and so use a private repository for that. So I have this Portland State Java, which is for um, uh, like the source code that I've been building up. And it's, it's kind of funny to like, you know, let me, sorry, I want to go back to it. And uh, it's kind of funny to see, well, I guess it wasn't in this one. So like, 
the, the commits in here, because I evolved it through several version control systems, go back to like 2001 or something. So it's always funny to see like a commit that happened like 16 years ago. It's like, huh. <laughs> anyway. Uh, right. So um, for this term, I'm going to create a new GitHub repository for all the code that I write here in class for you guys so that you guys can see it. So I'm going to add a new repository. I'm going to call it Portland State Java Summer 2018. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to say all of the code that we develop in CS410J, CS510J. Oops. So we should clone both Um. Oh, OK, so the question is, so you should uh, clone or you say clone or fork or both? <coughs> clone. You don't need to have a copy of my repository. Feel free to. Though you can clone the repository, so you can work with it, so you can modify the code yourself if you'd like, um, or you can just watch it online. You know, so if you're familiar with it, um, uh, you know, feel free to do that. Um, it's not a requirement of the course, though. And, and just to be clear, you're going to see me use GitHub a lot in the course. I like it. It gives me a backup. So like when we're you know doing TDD and I do some refactoring and everything goes sideways, I can easily revert it. Um, but it's not a requirement of the course. Just highly recommended, and it's just a good tool to learn. And I think it's a you know, gives you a good opportunity to uh, to do so. That answer your question. Uh, yeah, I guess. So yeah, you, please, you know, feel free to clone it. It's out there for everybody to see. Not a requirement of the course, though. Okay. Uh, summer of 2018 is public. Uh, yep. Initialize it with a README. Uh, I want this. So this will be primarily Java. And I like to have all of mine Apache licensed. So Port of Say Java 2018. Great. Okay. This has created a source code repository. So this is a repository. This is where I can put some, uh, some source code. Um, it initialized the repository with a couple of files. One is called git ignore. Um, there are some kind of files that you don't want in your uh, version control system. Usually they are files that are created from other files. So like when you compile you know, a .c file into a .o or something like that, um, you don't want to check in your object files. You don't want to check in those intermediate, uh, 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 inter intermediate or just binary files um, because uh, you can create them from something else, because they can be large, because they're binary. And so then if you look at changes between two binary files, I mean, going back in history doesn't make any sense. I was like, oh, look, that bit twiddled from zero to one. Oh, that's where my bug is now. Um, and so then, uh, UJ files, <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, so by default, uh, if you, uh, git will uh, ignore, will not try to add class files and log files and uh, all like jars and wars, we'll talk about what those are, um, to, to the repository. And so this is nice. So if you have those there in your file system, git will just ignore them and not try to, not try to add them. And it also initializes it with a license file and with a readme, which is essentially this markdown syntax for uh, uh, for uh, for the uh, for what's here on the uh, on the the homepage for the uh, for the repository. So I've created one of these things in GitHub. Uh, so uh, this is off on GitHub. Uh, it is this code repository, and now I want to add some code to it. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to clone it. So I'm going to go back here to the top. I've got this menu, which is clone or download. I'm going to copy it. It has this URL, um, which allows you to uh, basically make a local copy of the repository so that I can start doing, I can start adding stuff to this repository. So I'm going to say git clone of that URL. This uh, logs into GitHub as me. I've done some configuration, of course, in my account. I've shared SSH keys. GitHub has really great online documentation, so I'm not going to walk you through all that process. Um, if you have questions, feel free to ask them on the Google Plus community. So it just um, created a, a file called Portland State Java Summer 2018. And now I have that same license file and that same README. I've also got uh, .gitignore. 
And I got something called .get .git, which is like the database of all the files and stuff. Don't mess with that. It's all it's all internal bookkeeping stuff. So this is neat. Okay, great. Now I've got my repository checked out. Now I want to put some stuff in it. Okay. So pause that. Let's go back to the assignment now. Uh, I'll leave that open. Okay. There are two tools that you'll need to install um, on whatever machine you're developing on for this course, or at least for this project. One is called the Java Development Kit. Um, if you use Java before, you're probably familiar with this. So this includes the Java runtime, which allows you to run Java programs, and then a whole bunch of tools for working with Java. Things like the Java compiler, and the thing that generates Java docs, and the thing that creates jar files, all of that uh, good stuff. So um, in this course, uh, well, and uh, actually I just sent a link to the, um, to the Google uh, community um, uh, on, of how to get this stuff. For this course, you want to use the latest version of Java, which is Java 10. Um, so please make sure that that is installed and on your path. Um, I think you also need to set the Java home environment variable. All of this is documented. Um, that's what it is on my Mac. So you need to use the you need to have the Java tools set up the JDK, and there's also a tool called Maven whose command line uh, script is MVN Maven. And uh, here I think we recommend I, I require a version that's at least like five three point five point two or something, so a pretty recent uh, version. So make sure to have that installed also. Um, the, the installation process for a JDK is like, yeah, you download an installer, so it's like you know, on Windows there's a little wizard, or there's RPMs on Linux and all that kind of good stuff, and, and uh, packages on Mac. Um, Maven's a little bit more old school. Maybe they have RPMs, and actually if you're using, uh, I think most Linux distributions have a Maven package. Whether or not it's up to date with 3.5.2 is between you and your package maintainer. Um, but anyway, you can also just download the zip file and install it uh, locally, like, you know, there in your off directory or in your home directory or wherever you want. Um, it works out really well. But anyway, you want this version of Maven also. So the JDK and Maven are two things that you need to get started. Um, oh, and if you're using git, you know, I use the, the, the git command line oops, too also. Uh, and git is something that you'll need to install uh, also if you're going to use git. Again, not a requirement, but highly recommended. Okay, Maven. Now, um, there's a whole lecture on Maven. I won't go into too many of the details, but the whole idea is that Maven allows you to manage your Java projects. Um, when you build a Java application, there are many pieces parts. There is your source code, but you might also have things like uh, message files that can be localized in different languages. And if you're writing a web application, you might have images that get served up. And then there are other configuration files that, uh, you know, you might have HTML files for web applications, all sorts of good stuff like that. This can get really complex really quickly. And there are all these tools that you work with. Um, and uh, what Maven provides is a standard means for configuring all these tools to build your application. So after you install Maven, there is a very important step um, that, you, uh, that, that you need to do uh, in order to um, get, uh, get artifacts that I create. So your projects depend on code that I wrote. And so what I do is I have often uh, in my code repository, I have that code and I have a Maven build that will build the, uh, the artifacts called jar files for Java archives that contain the compiled class files that your code relies on. And I publish those to a repository <laughs> um, on this bin tray site. And you need to configure Maven in something called the settings.xml uh, file, which is in your .m2 directory inside your home directory to tell Maven, hey, go look for artifacts off in, uh, in Dave's bin tray. And you do that with this XML right here. Um, so basically, you know, step one in all of, uh, in all of these projects um, is to copy uh, this settings into your settings XML. And this basically tells it, hey, this is another repository that I want you to look at. Oops. That was just a bad URL that I typed. Right, clicked on. So, uh, see here. Yep, there it is. Oh, never mind. That was probably like my 
password for GitHub or something. I just need to change that. Um, eh, don't click on that URL. Anyway, so you need to put it in that settings, and then you'll be able to download uh, download stuff from my repository. Once you do that, uh, we need. Or I, I uh, once you do that, you can get started with the project by um, using something called an archetype to create a new project based on a template that I publish. So uh, to get you started, I have like the beginnings of classes, I have the beginnings of a simple unit test for a simple class and stuff like that. Um, and that's embodied in this archetype. And so you use the maven command line, you say archetype generate, and you give it some uh, additional dash d options. Recall that in Linux, or on Unix, the backslash is a line continuation character for, uh, for your shell. So I'm just going to paste that in here. And it says, hey, create me a new Maven project based on the student archetype. Okay. And so it asked me a couple questions. Like, hey, I'm about to create a new project for you. What do you want its group ID to be? So the group ID identifies sort of like who's the organization that is uh, the organization or the individual who owns this project, is doing this project. Um, and uh, I always use edu pdx cs 410 j because it's like the course. Um, and then I'm just going to use my login ID because this is my project. When you do this for your projects, you'll use your login ID. This sort of uniquely identifies who's creating this project. The artifact ID is going to be student. The name of the project, the name of the thing that I'm creating is called student. The version doesn't really matter. Let's use the default of 1.0 snapshot. And it also asks you for the name of the, the package. So uh, as some of you might recall, Java classes are in something called a package, which provides a namespace and certain uh, visibility restrictions for, uh, for that code. Um, by default, the name of the package is the same as the group ID. Sure, let's keep that. And it asks me to confirm. Yes, this is all correct. Poof, and it goes and creates this. And now what I have here, let me uh, do this again. In addition to my license and my README, I now have a student directory. And this is all created from about by Maven as part of that archetype. Uh, it's got some uh, it's got some code. Actually, let's see here. Uh, do I have dash tree in this thing? No, I don't. Dash dash tree. Nope. Uh, well, there's not that much to see. Well, actually, I'll show it to you in a much better way in a moment. Um, so, so cool. You've got some source code, and now I can like show it to you, you know, Java. Look, you've got a student.java, and just briefly, uh, it looks just like what was there in the assignment. So it creates one of these empty student classes. Doesn't do very much, uh, but it's there. And that's cool. So uh, I've got myself a student archetype. I've got myself a new student project. And uh, I've got some source code there, there, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add it to Git. So now uh, Git has staged everything, meaning, hey, uh, oh, I'm here to Git repository. You just put some new files down there. Yep, I want to add those to the repository. So I said add. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to commit to the repository, meaning, oh, I've got some files. I've got some changes to files. Changes to the repository. I want to add them to the repository. I'm going to say uh, add uh, initial files from Maven project archetype. And I'm going to commit everything in the current directory, which is student, really. Great. And it added them. Um, and now uh, those are in the repository. So now if I look at the log of all the changes, here is my initial commit that I made a couple minutes ago. And here's the uh, commit that I just made with my message. So the repository, again, lets you sort of look back in time and lets you uh, say, hey, my code is a stable point. I want to put it in the repository so that I've got like this nice line in the sand where I know everything works. I've com when I commit, I make changes to the repository here on the local machine. But now I want to share this with the world. So now what I want to do is something called a git push, which will push the changes in my local repository back up to the GitHub repository um, for everybody to see. <clears throat> And it's sending it off to GitHub. It said yes, it was successful. And now when I go back to GitHub, I'll refresh. And it said, great, I just added some files from the Maven project archetype, and here's my student directory. And now I've got the same stuff up here. And so now, 
you know, if someone, if one of you had made a copy of this repository, then you could uh, then pull those changes down to your local repository and work with them. So I use, again, I use Git for a couple of reasons. One is to share, the other is to back up. <laughs> so now if something happens you know, to my machine or I accidentally blow away my directory, I've still got a copy up there on GitHub of all of my changes and all of the revision histories there and all of that good stuff. So anyway. So you're going to see me as I code, I sort of get into this loop where like I write a test, I make it work, I do a little bit of refactoring, and I commit because I know that everything is uh, nice and stable. And then you can you know, follow, uh, follow along on GitHub if you so desire. Okay, so back to my project. Okay, so uh, I'm here in my student directory. I've got something called pom.xml, and that's the Maven configuration file. For the time being, for tonight, we're just going to leave it at that. Um, that basically tells Maven, here's, uh, here's all the configuration settings for this project. You can watch the Maven lecture and you can learn more about it. Um, it's something that you should be aware of, but it's not like something that you need to be super, it's not going to be the primary focus of the course. What will be the primary focus, of the primary focus of the course is using Maven to do interesting things. So um, let's see here. I think here in the assignment, yes. It says do a Maven verify. What Maven verify does is it builds your application, it runs all the unit tests, um, and it creates the uh, well, it creates the uh, it creates the artifact, um, and then it uh, uh, and, and uh, then it runs some more tests and everything like that. So it's going off and doing its thing. So now it's running the unit tests. Well, actually, it ran the unit tests. Let me walk through this, and I'll go a little bit slower because I'm talking very quickly. It does some pre-flight checks. The first thing it does is it compiles the source code. So that student, that student class, it compiles that. It compiles successfully, it goes on to the next step, which is running the unit tests. We'll take a look at the unit tests in a moment. That's the uh, simple student test. It was successful. Uh, <laughs> failure, zero, error, error, zero. Test run one, everybody was happy. Then moves on to the next phase, which is building the jar file, which is uh, basically an archive of all the compiled class files. Then it runs some additional tests, which are called the integration tests. And we'll see that those are sort of advanced tests that uh, test uh, a wider swath of functionality than just the unit tests. Um, and then that was it, and everybody was happy. Um, and so this is cool, right? Kind of gets your entire application life cycle. I just want to ask you guys something in a minute. Um, in your other computer science courses, how much have you talked about testing? Okay, this is not like A-OK, -okay, this is like zero? This is like, okay. Okay then. Um, that's going to change with this class. Uh, in my career, I've evolved to the, to the point where I've realized that like Testing isn't like an adjunct or something that you do on the side. Testing is software development. Right? We want to write stuff that works. We want to know that, and I'm going to get up my soapbox lots of times on this, but we want to be able to be confident uh, in what our software is supposed to do, and we want to be able to demonstrate that it does that. And the best way to do that is to write a test that verifies that. Um, and so then uh, the way I develop code and the way I encourage you guys to uh, develop code is to write tests for it. So tests are really important. And so then the nice about Maven is that, yep, it has the same philosophy. And so like built in your application lifecycle is running tests. And so when the tests fail, your application doesn't build. And that's an important thing. Okay, good. So our, um, our uh, project runs. Sorry, let me get up here. Uh, when you run Maven, it creates um, uh, artifacts. It builds things in a directory called target. Um, this is all sorts of stuff. I'm not going to go into all the details, but it has things like your jar file. It has things like the output of your um, uh, tests and, and stuff like that. We'll go into more detail in later classes, um, in later lectures. But it's all there in one directory. Um, which is nice, so that if you want to like blow away all of your things, you just, it blow away all of your um, uh, compiled artifacts, all of your generated th things that are generated from other files, you just delete one directory. Uh, so that keep th keeps things nice and clean. So, what have we done so far? We've used Maven to create ourselves a project, and we check the source code into GitHub. Then we used Maven to build our project, and yay, everything's successful. 
Now it's time to start looking at some code. And uh, the tool that I recommend that you use for working with your code is IntelliJ. So IntelliJ is a uh, an uh, integrated development environment uh, for Java. I mean, it is a commercial product, but there is a community edition available, and there's also an academic license uh, available. Um, if you're not, uh, if if you don't have a favorite Java IDE, um, I highly recommend IntelliJ. Uh, if but if you're one of those people that likes Eclipse, if you like Eclipse, if you like your IDE, you can keep your IDE. Fine, you can use Eclipse for this course. I don't really care, but I'm going to use IntelliJ, and I'm not going to help you try to get Eclipse to work because my God, it's awful. Um, so uh, you know, uh, this is one of those lessons in capitalism. But it's like if someone creates a product that's better than the open source one, people will pay for it. Um, and I gladly at work pay for uh, for this. I use the academic license course for this. Um, but uh, yeah, and so I don't know. I can't remember exactly how it works, but um, please check out their uh, the the the. The JetBrains website, JetBrains is the company that makes it uh, IntelliJ. Um, and I'm pretty sure you can sign up for an academic license and they'll see your um, pdx.edu email address. And I'm pretty sure then they'll turn it around pretty quickly. Um, either that or maybe there's a site license. I can't remember. Ugh. Yeah. Um, go try it and tell everybody else how it works. Because I got my license already. Anyway. Uh, okay. Sorry. This is a different project. I'm just going to minimize this so it's out of the way. Okay. So. Um, here I have uh, my directory. I want to open up the source code for uh, that, that, that that's there in that directory inside IntelliJ. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate to uh, oh wait I don't want that one I want the PSU one PSU Git Port and State Java Summer 2018 Students. So I open up the directory. I point IntelliJ at the directory, and it's like, oh, I see a pom.xml, maven, old buddy, old pal, or, or whatever. Anyway, um, and, uh, and it's like, ah, oh, great, I, I know how to, I know what this project looks like. Do you want me to create a new IntelliJ project for it? And I say, yes, yes, I do. I want to open it up in a new window um, because I like Windows, having multiple windows open. Um, and okay, so it opens up. It gives me this little pop-up saying, unregistered VCS root detected, uh, and it's like, oh, hey, look. I've, this is like Clippy. I, I've noticed that you're using version control. Would you like to like hook it all up to IntelliJ? I'm like, yes, I would, because IntelliJ has really good support for Git and GitHub. Okay, so uh, I've got my IDE here, and over here on the left, I can navigate to the um, to the classes and such for my uh, for my project. So here's my student class. No. Seriously, this is a table leg. I don't know where the table is, though. I thought it was maybe a telescope, but it's, it's not. Wow, it is like furious outside. I think we're going to have those freak windstorms. You went on the west side. Actually, it happened on the east side, too, a little while ago. Yeah, we had a tree branch come down and hit the house, mess up a gutter. Anyway, um, well, now it's quiet in here. Yeah, it's going to get stuffy in here in a little bit, too. Um, maybe we can open up the shades or the windows during break or something. Anyway, here is your, uh, here is the, here, here's the, the student, um, uh, here's the student class, and it's got the main method. Um, IntelliJ, uh, so here's the source code right here, and then over here in the margin, uh, it has all sorts of like little uh, interesting things that you can do. Um, I was going to show this one right here. So this class has a main method, which means that it can be the start of a program. And so then you can click this little uh, run button here to, to run it. And uh, no, why is it asking me about, oh my gosh, stop, 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 stop. Okay. No, you're being super annoying. Okay, I'll fix that in a moment. Um, I ran my main program and it showed me the output down here. And it says, oh, look, it printed out missing command line arguments. Sure enough, that's what I have this program do. Print out, print out missing command line arguments, standard error. I think it's in red, which means it's standard error, but anyway. Um, and so you can do things like run your programs from, uh, from IntelliJ. You can also run your program from the command line, and that's an important thing to note. Uh, it's here in the assignment. It's this thing right here. 
So uh, you say Java dash jar. So this says run the Java virtual machine um, with uh, using all the classes in this jar file. So this is student. Uh, yep, there's the name of the artifact dash the version. And uh, I don't need command line arguments because it doesn't parse any of them. And sure enough, it prints out missing command line arguments. Okay, so this is like running your program in, in different ways. There's one more thing that I want to show, and then we'll take a break. Uh, you might have noticed that IntelliJ was complaining about, like, hey, do you want to add this stuff to GitHub? Ah. And I'm like, wait, no. Um, I've been doing some things in this directory. I, I ran uh, Maven. I ran uh, in IntelliJ. I, I created in, in IntelliJ, and that created some files. So if I do a git status, say, hey, well, what have I done to, uh, what, what changes have I made? Um, it has some things in red here, meaning, oh, hey, these are some files that are there in the local directory, but aren't in, uh, aren't in the repository. Do you want to add them? And in this case, the answer is a resounding no. I don't want to check in things like my target directory, which has all my class files. Don't want that. <coughs> uh, I don't want all of these things from my idea project. Uh, there's a school of thought that says, oh, you should check in your, um, your IDE files into source code. I don't subscribe to that philosophy. I think that's obnoxious, especially when you end up with like somebody else's Eclipse settings in your source code. I don't want that stuff. So that, here again, that, in my mind, that's all like generated from something else. So um, I don't want that in there. And like same thing with the IML file and it's dependency reduced POM. I don't want that there either. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add those files to, uh, to my gitignore fi git ignore file. And I think I can do that from IntelliJ pretty easily. Oh yeah, it's got unversioned files. So I'm going to make this a little bigger so we can see all of this stuff. Okay, so uh, you'll see me use this quite a lot, but there's a tab here that talks about version control, and this has been integrated with Git and GitHub, well, Git, um, and so it says, look, there's all this stuff here that is, uh, that is not under version control, and should it be? The answer is no. I'm going to change this by directory. Awesome. And so now it's saying, hey, here are all these unversion files. I want to ignore these, and so if I right-click on them, I can say ignore. Uh, ignore all files under .idea, and then I want to ignore these guys also, and ignore the specified two files, yes. Still thinking about it? Uh, try one at a time. Ignore that. Oh, interesting. Why isn't it ignoring it? Oh, there you go. I said you need to refresh it, I guess. It wasn't smart enough. So no local changes. Okay, that's cool. So now if I go over here, I say, okay, what local changes do you think from the command line? Oh, interesting. It didn't do what I wanted it to. I was hoping that IntelliJ would then actually ignore it by changing the .git ignore file. That's lame. Okay, sorry. So I want to do something else. Um, and, uh, eh. so now I'll, uh, edit dot get ignore file to, uh, to add stuff like <coughs> IntelliJ files. So that will be dot idea slash da slash uh, oops uh, actually and I think I want to have a star there star slash dot idea and then I want star slash dependency and I want star slash, and actually I think I just want dot it, oops, star dot IML. That works. So now if I say get status, oh, and target also.
and it's got Emacs backup files. Fine. Star dash. Yay! So okay. So now, Git is like, great. You've told you've modified the Git ignore file to ignore all the other things that should be ignored. That's awesome. So I'll uh, then commit that off to the repository and say ignore uh, IntelliJ and Maven files. Maven files. Awesome. So now. Okay, yeah, it's told me, okay, great, nothing in the working directory, and hey, there's one change that you could publish to, uh, that you could push to GitHub, <coughs> I'll go ahead and do that, and now everybody's happy. Okay. So, let me quick take stock of where we're at. We created a GitHub repository for the source code that I'm going to build for you guys, with you guys, during this course. We use Maven to create a new project that contains this very simple student uh, application. We used, uh, and we put that source code into GitHub. We get, we pushed it up to GitHub so we could see how everything shared. We then used Maven to build the project. wasn't very much to see because everything compiled and everything was happy. That, that's good. That's fine. That's where we want to start. And then we opened up that source code in IntelliJ so that we could see that we could edit it. And we'll be doing a lot more of that um, for this for this project. And uh, then we clean up the git ignore stuff so that uh, it's clear which code should be checked in, which code shouldn't be. Any questions on that? Yes? Is the screencast going to be available on your website after? It'll be available on YouTube. Yes, so play along at home, give it a dance remix, whatever it is you want to do. Uh, I keep waiting for someone to do the dance remix. I make that joke every year, usually several times every year. Anyway, um, yeah. And Ben will do it, too. Um, OK, cool. Let's uh, take a break. After break, we'll start talking about test-driven development. During the break, here are the little cards. Um, come up to the front of the room. Get yourself a little card. And I'm here on the little like podium, like I'm a music conductor or something. It's totally awesome. Get a little card. And then uh, return it up here, please, when you're done. <laughs> 